данном выпуске представлен. Step by step, we will show you how dirty political games are played and how little human life is worth. This video contains fairly graphic material, so viewer discretion is strongly advised. This week, a lavish funeral was held in Isurata for one of the fighters against the Qaddafi regime. Omran Juma Shaban was awarded such high honors for his outstanding achievement, the capture of Colonel Qaddafi. It was he who had found the colonel hiding in a drainage pipe, and the world saw pictures of him happily mocking and gloating over his defenseless victim. But he didn't have long to bask in glory. A year later, Omran Shaban shared the sad fate of the colonel. Earlier in July, Shaban was sent with an unimportant mission to the city of Bani Walid. With him he had three friends, who were also involved in the operation to capture Qaddafi. This esteemed company was sent to Bani Walid to negotiate the release of two captured journalists with the city's elders. Всю отличившуюся компанию отправили в Бани Валид для переговоров со старейшинами по освобождению двоих взятых в плен журналистов. We should note that Bani Walid is a city that until recently was fighting for Qaddafi and broke neither under daily NATO bombing nor under the numerous rebel assaults. Such steadfast resistance won the city the right to ignore policies of the new Libyan authorities. It does not recognize a new anthem, children are educated under the old school program, and in general life goes on as it always has. And there is nothing the new government can do about it. Bani Walid is the capital of the Warfala tribe, and these guys have no reason to love Libya's pro-American rulers. Under Qaddafi, this tribe enjoyed exceptional privileges, but now its representatives have been expelled from all positions of power and are subjected to routine discrimination. It would seem that the best solution would be for the central government to organize a new assault on the rebellious city to solve this problem once and for all, but this isn't possible. Bani Walid is home to about 100,000 people, all of whom were well armed and trained. If even NATO airstrikes didn't help break the city, the new government forces surely have no hope to take it either. This is why the authorities sent diplomatic missions to Bani Walid as if it were a troublesome neighbor and not their own Libyan territory. So when Shiban and his three thugs arrived in Bani Walid, the local elders decided to ignore rules of diplomacy and promptly threw these distinguished guests into prison. We can only guess what the prison guards did to them. But when Libya's new temporary ruler, Mohammed Yusuf al Maghreb, personally went to Bani Walid to rescue them, only three were released, including Shaban. The fourth one probably didn't live long enough. The freed prisoners were also in pretty bad shape. Shaban himself was paralyzed and was rushed to a hospital in Paris, but the local doctors could do nothing to help. Thus, the man who caught Gaddafi finally died a much more horrible death than the colonel. The point of the story is this. The man who was responsible for Qaddafi's capture is dead. His three accomplices are dead or close to dying, and three other members of the Qaddafi operation were killed shortly before, under mysterious circumstances. Pretty soon there will be no living witnesses of the colonel's murder. Do you really believe there is no connection between all of these events? We are not sure such coincidences are purely random. Furthermore, the recent murder of the American ambassador Christopher Stevens fits this chain of events perfectly. If you recall, Mr. Stevens was one of the organizers of the Libyan aggression and of course had access to a lot of confidential information. By the way, another scandal took place last week. The American media published the ambassador's personal diary in which he wrote about the deteriorating situation in Benghazi. The ambassador felt threatened and requested the State Department to strengthen the embassy's security, but had no response. In addition, the new Libyan authorities have also warned about the impending attack on the embassy. The US State Department expressed outrage that journalists published Stephen's diary, but admitted that the attack was indeed planned. 
But let's go back to Libya. Almost all those who witnessed Gaddafi's murder are dead. The ambassador, who most likely knew the real story of the murder, is also dead, and the embassy's secret archives have disappeared. It is obvious that whoever is behind this cover-up does not want anyone to ever find out what had happened to Gaddafi in reality. But why now? The answer is simple. October 20th is the anniversary of Gaddafi's death, followed by US presidential elections two weeks later. How easy would it be for someone to throw out Obama's dirty laundry into the public light just before the elections, ensuring he doesn't have enough time to clean up? Let's go back to Libya a year ago and look at events leading up to that fatal day. In early October 2011, the situation has reached a final impasse. Despite the fact that the rebels had a significant part of the country under their control, the cities of Sirte and Bani Walid continued to withstand their onslaught. Gaddafi himself was still alive and was presumably in hiding in Sirte. NATO aircraft continued their airstrikes, burying more and more civilians under concrete rubble, but without any measurable result. Meanwhile, a similar military campaign was already being planned for Syria, so something had to be urgently done to resolve the situation. So what happens on October 19th, the day before Gaddafi is captured? Hillary Clinton, head of the US Department of State, suddenly pays Libya an unannounced visit. She meets with the then leader of the Transitional National Council, Mahmoud Jibril. What was the need for such haste, especially noting Clinton's arrival at the very unsafe Tripoli airport? The fact of the matter is that at that time, NATO commanders have already openly declared imminent departure from Libya. Time was running out, the budget was stretched to bursting, and everyone was getting ready to bring the next victim, Syria, on stage, leaving it up to the rebels to finish the job in Libya. But how could NATO leave Libya without accomplishing its main mission, killing Gaddafi? Neither the American TV viewers nor the European taxpayers would have forgiven such a lackluster ending to this war show, especially with the French elections just around the corner. In other words, leaving Libya without killing Gaddafi was not an option, as it would make bringing the war to Syria and other countries difficult to explain to domestic voters. And so, miraculously, Gaddafi gets caught the next day, although admittedly under some very strange circumstances. It is reported that he had urgently left CERT in a convoy. The NATO air forces immediately struck the convoy, but the colonel managed to escape and took refuge in a drainage pipe, where he was soon captured by our hero Amran Shaban. The whole process of the capture looks rather theatrical. For some reason, Gaddafi was wearing ceremonial dress, in which he used appeared on Western TV. He was armed with a golden gun, an integral part of the run-of-the-mill Arab dictator outfit, which the Western viewer sees as a certain standard. But the most interesting thing is that after suffering a lot of abuse at the hands of his captors, the colonel's body had simply disappeared. At first, the Libyan leadership refused to come, saying that the body was buried in a secret location. Then they announced that the body was cremated and the ashes scattered at sea. And that's all, folks. End of story, same as with the killing of wow. the man. Immediately after Gaddafi's murder, the Western coalition wraps up its military operation in Libya and the public attention promptly switches to events that start to unfold in Syria. Meanwhile, questions remain. Who really killed Gaddafi? And most importantly, was he really killed at all? Remember we mentioned Mahmoud Jibril, who was paid a visit by Secretary Clinton on the eve of Gaddafi's death. Well, old man Jibril recently made an interesting statement. While at the International Conference of the Arab Spring in Cairo, he gave an interview to the Egyptian channel Dream TV, in which he directly accused international intelligence services of murdering Gaddafi. The Gaddafi murder is the work of an international intelligence service, not the Libyan revolutionaries as everyone thinks. The goal was to silence Gaddafi, who knew too many secrets and had a lot of important documents. And so everything suddenly falls into place. The suspiciously theatrical death, the destruction of the colonel's body, the systematic elimination of all witnesses, the murder of US Ambassador Chris Stevens, and loss of his archives. Perhaps Gaddafi was captured by special services a lot earlier, during the storming of Tripoli. However, this was not made public because certain negotiations were taking place where he was needed alive. Further, it was necessary to preserve the appearance of the elusive Gaddafi threat in order to have a free hand in clearing out his supporters. On the other hand, there is also the version that Gaddafi was not killed and is currently hiding in an unspecified African country. The world was shown a mock-up of his death, perhaps filmed long in advance, or perhaps shot in real time using a lookalike. Unfortunately, it is difficult to say what is real and what is not, 
but we will return to our investigation in the near future. On September 6, 2012, the Human Rights Watch released a report which stated the Western intelligence services have actually worked for Gaddafi for over eight years. They sought out his enemies around the world, tortured them for information, and then sent them to the colonel, who was not always merciful. The day before this report was published, Mauritania extradited the colonel's former intelligence chief, Abdullah Sinusi, to Libya. No doubt this man is in possession of extremely important data, which is now under control of the new government. On September 27th, following publication of Ambassador Stevens' diaries, the US Congress demanded that the Obama administration provide a full report on the incident. The State Department said that the Special Investigative Commission will be created, but its findings will become available only next spring. We doubt that the Senate Republicans are going to wait that long, because they need this information before the presidential elections. Libya, blood, the soul, I'm